Well, up to this point, we've talked about the development of mainstream pop music in the period up to 1955. And at the beginning of this, uh, this series of lectures, I said we were going to think about two other styles of music, country and western, uh, and rhythm and blues. So now we take up the story of a country and western. I don't know how many of you have seen the Blues Brothers movie, but there's a fantastic, uh, interesting scene where John Belushi is talking to, they, they go to this club, they're looking for a gig, it's a, it's a club out in the sticks, it's a country club, and it says that the good old boys are going to be performing that night, and the Blues Brothers show up, the band, the, the good old boys band hasn't actually shown up, so the Blues Brothers convince themselves they're the good old Blues Brothers boys. <laughs> but at, after the, the gig is finished and they're all packed up and they're leaving, the actual good old boys do show up and uh, John Belushi starts to talk to the guy to kind of maybe try to worm out of this so he doesn't have to give him the money or anything. He says, so what kind of music do you play? And the, the, the country music mission says, oh, we play both kinds, country and western. And that's supposed to be a joke because people think this guy's so limited that he thinks the whole world exists in country and western music that they're actually two kinds of music. The actual truth is that in the period before 1945, there were two kinds of music, country and western. And that's what we're going to talk about, those early days before 1945 and what was, what, what was thought of as country music and what was thought of as western music. Now, country and western music overall was often referred to as hillbilly music. It was music that was, th that was thought to be of interest and, and, con and would be consumed by people who were relatively low income, low educated, rural listeners, mostly in the South. Uh, we will find out that through the course of the Second World War and through migration patterns, it turns out that a lot of these folks ended up in northern cities, but we'll get to that story soon enough. Let's now talk about the difference between country and western uh, for the rest of this video. Country music is associated with the southeast, uh, with the Appalachian region, uh, and is very much influenced by white gospel. There was a guy by the name of Ralph Peer who went into the South and in the 20s started recording up um, as many people as he could on a, on a portable uh, recording machine that he had, a disc, disc cutting machine, uh, sometimes wire recorders. Um, and some of the people that he would get would be as close as probably were ever going to come to hearing what that original regional music sounded like before um, anybody was, uh, b before it got sort of um, on the radio and became a little bit more um, affected by other cultures. And so some of the first people that he recorded, Ralph Peer recorded, were Fiddlin', John Carson, and I love this group, Gid Tanner, and his Skillet Lickers, right? This is very much sort of indigenous uh, southeastern uh, culture. But probably the two most important acts, um, two most important groups from this early country uh, scene uh, would be the Carter family with their Can the Circle Be Unbroken from 1935. You get a real sense not only of the gospel influence, of the harmony singing, but also of Maybelle Carter's uh, distinctive guitar solo where she plays the melody on the low strings while also sort of playing the chords above it. Uh, among uh, country guitar players, that's sort of a famous a solo that a lot of them point to as being important in the development of country music. Also, Roy Acuff was an enormously popular person among country music people. Uh, a good example of his music is uh, The Great Speckled Bird from 1936. Without giving too much away, he says in the lyrics, The Great Speckled Bird is the Bible. And so again, you get this connection to the white gospel uh, tradition in this music. He also uses a slide guitar. There's also a slide guitar on that recording. And we're reminded that the slide guitar in this case comes from a craze from about the same time of Hawaiian guitar in America. And so they were actually using not so much a bottleneck thing like we're going to hear in rhythm and blues music, but more like a Hawaiian uh, guitar. There were no pedals or anything on it. The, gu the car was just tuned open. But it was that sort of Hawaiian guitar thing that eventually morphed into the steel guitar playing that became so characteristic of country music in the period after 1945. We hear that already in Roy Acuff's music from 1936 and coming from the, from the uh, craze for Hawaiian slide guitar. In juxtaposition to country music, which was uh, from the southeast, we can talk about Western music, which was from the Southwest, mostly Texas and Oklahoma, and also the West Coast, California. Western music sort of broke down into two possible things. You either had Western swing, and the guy, the guy who was big in Western swing was Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys. For all intents and purposes, the Western swing bands were, were 
a, a regular big band, except that they, um, they used uh, fiddles, and sometimes he would use a sort of south of the border uh, kind of a horn section, uh, but it was, uh, it was sort of country, uh, country music meets big band. Uh, and those Bob Wills recordings, you might want to check out New San Antonio Rose from 1940. Interestingly, that was a hit for him, him on the country charts. It was then covered by Bing Crosby and was a hit for Bing Crosby on the mainstream pop charts. You'd never would have heard the Bob Wills record on the mainstream pop charts, but the Bing Crosby version, no problem there. In addition to Western Swing, the other style from, that, um, from the Western uh, 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 part of this is Gene Autry, uh, Gene Autry and the Cowboy song. The idea of the sort of Hollywood cowboy sitting on a horse out there, sort of, you know, uh, 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 on, a, on, a, on a ranch somewhere, you know, with his guitar on and singing a song. In the case of Gene Autry, you can hear a tune like Back in the Saddle Again from 1939 and really get an idea of what the cowboy song was about. That's what was Western about that music. Of course, a lot of these guys appearing in movies at the time, cowboy musicals uh, kind of things, and the important ones were not only Gene Autry, but also Roy Rogers. We could take just a minute to talk about somebody who might be thought of as the first real star of country music, country and western music, before it really came together as a kind of major industry in Nashville. We'll talk about Nashville in the next video. That person who was the first big star of country music is a fellow by the name of Jimmy Rogers, who was uh, active from about 1927 through 1923. He died at the age of 36 from tuberculosis, but uh, his records had a tremendous appeal. Uh, his, his, now, now we have a sense where his particular performances, not just the songs themselves, but his particular performances, uh, made a very big difference. And he was, uh, he was, his singing style uh, was uh, very influential on, on people like not only Gene Autry, who we talked about just a minute ago, but also, also uh, Ernest Tubb uh, in Eddie Arnold. Um, the thing about Jimmy Rogers that's interesting is not only his music itself, but the fact that already we start to see an image being constructed for Jimmy Rogers to portray him in a particular kind of way. So when you bought the sheet music for a Jimmy Rogers song, you saw him in one of two images. He was either the blue yodeler or he was the singing brakeman. The singing brakeman is interesting because it would always have him looking like he worked on a railroad, sort of wearing overalls as if he was some kind of a guy who, you know, worked on a railroad and when he got some time he would go into one of the cars and sing him a song and then he would get back to fire on the, the, the furnace on the, the, on the train or whatever. Uh, but of course Jimmy Rogers, the actual guy, would never really worked on a railroad or did any of those kinds of things. This was all a kind of way of marketing Jimmy Rogers, constructing an image of authenticity around who he was. That's going to be really important as we continue to tell our story. The idea that these images of authenticity are almost always constructed. That doesn't make them invalid, but it does mean that we're starting to see how the machinery is beginning to work. Um, it isn't enough that he's a country singer. We have to construct an image of him as a country singer, and we see that. Um, to get, an advan to get a, a, a representative example of what his music sounded like, I would recommend the song Blue Yodel from 1927, a song that was later covered by Leonard Skinner uh, in the 70s. This song features the, um, the, uh, the sort of trademark uh, Jimmy Rogers yodel. You might wonder, what's yodeling, which seems to be more associated with like the Swiss Alps or something, doing in country music uh, in the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s. But there it is, and it catches hold, and a lot of people imitate that. So Jimmy Rogers can be thought of as the first star of country music. In the next video, we'll talk about how country music really comes together in 1945 in Nashville, Tennessee.